You are listening to the OK Dad podcast. Please leave your message for Oh Daddy. Oh Daddy. Okay, Daddy. OK Dad podcast. Let's start this thing. Can you not put that on YouTube? You're listening to my husband talk a lot. What is hey going on, Corey? Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Oh, not too bad. My my kid's not feeling well today, and he was. I was like, hopefully it's not COVID. So. Oh man, yeah. I hope it's not. What's yeah, he got? No, he's, a fever? Or? He had a fever, and he was saying he had a sore throat, and then he threw up once today. So, um, we don't know. But his fever's down right now. But yeah. we'll see what happens. So you know the joy, the joys of parenting. You oh, know? definitely, definitely. I know. I remember when my son got his first fever. I was. I was trying to stay on top of it. My wife's a nurse. So Mm -hmm. she, when she sees a fever, she's like, oh, it's 99.1. That's a low grade fever. When it's a hundred point something, she's like, oh, it's this, this grade of a fever. If it's over one Oh something, like we got to go to the ER. And this, Mm -hmm. uh, I met my daughter when she was six. So having a newborn, Mm -hmm. I had no idea. So to me, a fever is a fever, a fever, right? And I, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough not knowing, especially like when other people have that that sort of information. Yeah, I um, I was talking to my wife today, and she said the good news is that he is he's three and a half now, so he can actually say what's wrong. You know, when they're smaller, they can't. They they just cry, and oh yeah, you, know, you kind of have an idea of what's going on. But when he's older, he can say this hurts, or I don't feel good here. You know, he's a little more aware of of his body, which is great. right, right. So Corey, tell me, tell me a little bit about yourself. I know uh, you reached out to me to be on. So you are the first guest I've had on that I have no affiliation with or I <laughs> don't have a background with, which is, is pretty cool. That's what I started this podcast. That's what everything's all about. I really do think having conversations with people that you normally wouldn't have a conversation with is where we get kind of some of our best experience and insights on. Most definitely. Yeah. I, I think that uh, it's always fun to meet someone brand new and try to, um, to get to know their perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I live in Michigan. Um, I am a, I'm 34. I had a, or no, I'm 33. Wow. This is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I'm a part-time podcaster, um, not even monetizing it yet, but I, I work in digital marketing for an orchestra here in Michigan. Oh, cool. So, um, I do a lot of their social media and stuff. I'm, I'm a dad of one right now. Uh, he's a three-year-old boy named Harrison. And, uh, yeah, besides that, I'm just, a everyday dad. I try, I try to, yeah. I have my fun as much as I can right now with COVID, but I like to cook. I like to listen to music. I'm a drummer. So a little bit of everything. Okay. Are you married? Yeah. My wife and I have been married for, oh gosh, I think we're coming up on eight years. Oh, congrats, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be this spring be eight years and uh, she's cool. She's a music teacher. Um, she teaches uh, younger elementary level uh, music. So my son has no chance in not being a musician. Uh, I think he's, <laughs> He's just, I bought him a drum set for his birthday this year and he loves that. Yeah, that's good. That's good, man. I guess to, to kind of start off and talk a little bit about it growing up, you had a stepdad. Yeah. So that, that's a whole story. Um, so my mom and dad, my biological father and my mom never married. And so my mom, uh, she took on the brunt of raising uh, me, my biological father, um, I, I know he cared about me. He loved me, but he just didn't have, he didn't have a clue as I like to say. So he, he was able to be there um, at times and it, when it was convenient for him and when he was able to take on that, that load. Um, and uh, we had a good relationship, you know, it was very fun always being around dad, but um, mom, mom did the majority of it. And um, eventually my mom met my stepdad when I was uh, about three, they got married when I was four and so the dy- dynamic shifted there because we moved out of the city we were in and mm-hmm. moved acro- moved like three hours away. And so um, my biological father really was very much absent, for lack of a better word. It was holidays and a couple of weeks here in the summer. Um, but uh, I was fortunate enough that I had a really great stepdad who um, came into that role. And I know there's a dynamic that is perceived with step parents you know there's like the evil step parent you know and the rebellious kid yeah 
um i'm very fortunate that my my stepdad never treated me like that i mean as soon as i came into his life um i was his blood we joked that the first night he, he met me he bought me a, a little caesar's pizza and i was sold <laughs> and i said if i don't know i could have got more i should have milked that you yeah know? <laughs> but um but I, I attribute um my ability as a parent as a dad um, based on these two ideas of what was done right in my life with my stepdad and to some extent what he did wrong, but also to what um, the other side of, of having a, an absent biological father, what, yeah. um, what he did wrong and what he did right. I mean, to an extent. Right. Yeah. And what, so him not being there that often, was that by design or was that just in his like personality? That was his personality. Um, he he's uh he's a the type of person who is very much uh very defiant in his life he always has to stick it to stick it to the man you know and uh, so okay he's never really been a stable person um he's had a history of substance abuse and um my mom um and him were both very violent people but there was some physical abuse there as well so really it was the best situation that they never got past um dating uh, conceiving me and then yeah. kind of putting to the end of that chapter um my my dad he was always welcome to be around my stepdad is, is a saint of a guy he always encouraged him to be around he never um gave him that judgment or anything and yeah but, he, but it was his choice you know it was um i'll come see you when i can or when things work out um, yeah i think i think that's a big that's a big step for a step parent to acknowledge and make is hey, like a biological dad or biological spouse should definitely open that door for them because it almost creates a bad stigma for the kid at the time about the step father or mother. And you don't know it as a kid that you're having some kind of resentment towards your stepmother or father but it does create one when we look back on it, that's when we see like, oh, you never let me see my biological father, whether it be for protection reasons, whether it be for emotional reasons, like, or, or just that bad stigma, like, hey, no, like I'm the parent, I'm the, I'm the father figure here now, you're not allowed to see anybody. I think when you let go of that and you allow your child to have that time with their biological or even that chance with their biological father it it makes you appreciate your step parent that much better not at that moment at the moment we don't know anything we're we're just six seven years old just drumming along most definitely and my i'm my stepfather i'm very lucky that he came to my life when i was pretty young i mean there were still times where um i had three four years before that but um, to be young and be growing up I still had that and the relationship has never been strained I mean we had the typical rebellious teenager phase that I was that yeah. I was <laughs> we all have that but there was never a straight up um, uh, contention point uh, where I was like you're not my dad I never said that to him yeah um, all the memories I had of him young were you know him playing with me in the backyard or having fun, even when I was doing chore, you know, making me do chores. And even though that's, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to do that stuff. That's something that um, it was always done respectfully. And yeah, um, he raised me as his kid, but it was never my keeping my dad out of the picture was never a problem. It was always about protecting me and kind of keeping me, um, me safe. And uh, my, my, for lack of a better word, the toxicity of my, my biological father. Yeah. Um, while that was never really uh, said, no, you can't be around him. I think that by design in his mind, he probably did that um, just out of, out of self pity or whatever and whatnot. Um, yeah. But one you, thing I, I, sorry, go ahead. Do you think, can you remember a time where you really tested your stepfather? Like for instance, I, one that I recall with my dad is, I had my driver's license. I was able to drive and we didn't have insurance on the vehicle that I had. We didn't have enough money to pay for that month. So I couldn't drive that month and I wanted to drive. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really, I really tested him during this because he was driving and we didn't have insurance. And so my whole thing was, Hey, like, how come it's okay for you, but it's not okay for me. And as a teenager, we don't know that we're on a one track path. Mm -hmm. 
and we got in a huge argument and I ended up just walking away from the house and it was, it was raining, it was cold. And I just kept walking for miles. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to walk to my grandparents' house. Like that was the only plan that I had. And my dad, not once from what I saw, my dad, not once tried to go get me, stop me, look for me. It was my mother that actually (laughs) drove up on the side of the road probably like four hours later, like crying, getting me back in the car so I can go back home. And we talked over, but that's one I know a few days later, like we sat down and we talked about a little bit more, but looking at back on that now, man, if, if I'm having conversations like that with my kids, like, I know that's one that's really going to test me if it's, especially if it's something of that degree, do you have anything that you feel like is similar that you like, (laughs) this was really testing your stepfather? So I think there were moments like that when I was younger and there, there's another layer to this equation that I'll, I'll mention in a second here, but um, I think about being young and having friends over. Uh, there was a time where I had friends over at the house and we were all hanging out and my dad wanted me to do chores and he's like, I, it was some kind of yard work and he's like, well, your friends can help you. <laughs> and like, you know, wanting to be the cool kid I was, I was like, no, I'm not doing this right now. Like I have friends over and I remember my dad, we lived on a dirt road. I remember him leaving the house because he was going back to work and him like, you know, like spinning dirt and like driving off, like speeding down the road. Yeah. And my mom was like, get your stuff together. Like, not like get stuff together, but like get, get your act together and like get, yeah. get stuff done. But what's, what's the really interesting thing about my relationship with my stepdad is that my mom actually passed away when I was 17. Oh man. So my mom um, had Lou Gehrig's disease and she was sick for basically my entire uh, high school career. So she got sick uh, the, the spring of my freshman year and we lost her uh, New Year's Eve 2004 and that was my senior year. So um, that dynamic was, it wasn't really tested in a negative way, but it was one that forced me to grow up a little faster, I think, than I yeah, would like to. Definitely. So there were, you know, it was little things like originally I didn't want to get my license until I was 18. I started taking drivers out at 16 because my mom was sick and I knew that I had to start driving myself around. Mm-hmm. It was um, staying overnight with her at the hospital during school days or even some school nights, you know, where. I had to be there to make sure her, because she had no function over her body, making sure that her, if her head fell forward, I could, you know, get up and push it back. So her ventilator didn't stop working or um, putting food in her food tube. So there's these things that uh, are very uh, complex in the sense of, you know, I want to be with my friends and I still had those chances to be a kid, but I still had to grow up and kind of wrap my head around the fact that my mom was going to die. So uh, that compounded um, my dad, uh, my stepdad at that point went into, um, into survival mode. Like, he didn't withdraw, but it was more about, okay, we got to make more money to make sure mom's comfortable. Cause she was in hospice care at our house. So yeah. he was working more hours. I was helping with the kids when I could, um, even, you know, after she, you know, she was driving, if I could drive them or making sure, you know, I was with them. Um, so it, it's, it's a lot of complex, things happening at that point in my life yeah there's a lot of emotional growth that usually (laughs) doesn't happen until your early to mid 20s there yeah most definitely yeah and there's this this point and i'm sure you're aware of it too when you're in high school that you're you're growing up and you're starting to test your limits like you said even with with the car um Mm -hmm. you're starting to define your life in your terms and you're kind of getting to that point where you're going to decide who am i going to be what am i going to do with with your with my life and right um, to have that experience of myself kind of altered by my mom's illness that that played a part big time yeah so that's kind of like your backstory to everything so how did that entail kind of mesh into meeting your wife or your now wife so my wife yeah that's one thing i always uh, think about often because i had this whole uh, idea of what i was going to do when i got done with um with co- with school post uh before my mom got sick actually it was i was going to move out of state i was going to go to school this school i wanted to study film i wanted to be a, a filmmaker and wanted to do these things with my life and then my mom got sick and i i started leaning towards music and there was a, a music business program at the local university 
And my dad was like, Hey, listen, I, um, I'd like you to stay home at least a year and be, you know, be here and kid for, for mom with the case stuff happens. And this was planning ahead of time, but my mom actually died before that, but I ended up staying local. And I think about my life, about the steps I would have taken. And my wife, I actually met her um, post college, well, towards the end of college career, um, about four or five years later, I think <laughs> maybe, maybe it was six <laughs> or seven. I took a bunch of time off during college. So, but yeah. then my college career, I met my wife and that was actually another, um, another significant point um, because I had intended uh, when I got my degree in music business, I wanted to move to Seattle. And okay. In, in nonprofit Seattle. And non yeah. uh, I want to work for Seattle opera actually. Oh, it's fun there, man. In Seattle. I, I yeah. love Seattle. And I, I, that was my goal. And uh, my last year of college, I was offered an internship with Seattle Opera. It was full time. It was everything I wanted. So uh, I actually got I, I packed my car. I didn't really do a lot of like foresight and floor planning, but I realized mm -hmm. I couldn't live out there as a college student working full time. See, I was pricey. I mean, that's yeah. what I was saying. And so I ended up yeah. coming back home and with my tail between my legs, a little oh. defeated. But um, I remember, and I'm, I'm kind of a religious person, I'm a religious person, I will say that, but I remember just thinking like, God, I need a win, you know, I need something. I just gave up mm -hmm. my, you know, a lot because I didn't, it didn't feel right. Yeah. And I met my wife about a month later, so. Oh, there's your so, sign, right? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's interesting how that happened, but I, I take it that I'm supposed to be where I am right now. And um, that's good. I, I like I mean, I'm in a good place. I, yeah, I have, I have a house, I have a job, I have a, a wife and a child. Life is good. So, yeah. And then five years later, here comes a small one. Yeah. Yep. How did, yeah. uh, how did you find out that you were having a baby? Was it planned? So it's interesting you say that because, um, it wasn't planned. Uh, but I remember it was the night before, uh, the 2016 elections. Oh, so, okay. So, so every, everyone's everyone's cautiously aware of what's going on in the world. Yeah. Okay. You know, no matter what side you fall on, we were all glued to our TVs. And my wife comes out of the bathroom and she has this look of like a gas. She's like, and I look at her. I'm like, okay, you come out of the bathroom. There's only like two things that can be really significant yeah. coming out of the bathroom with that face. And I said, pregnant. She goes, or I said, pregnancy test. She goes, uh huh. I said, positive. <laughs> Uh huh. I said, well, you know, I said, cool. I said, let's, let's go to the doctor, make sure everything's good, but let's, you know, let's be happy. Yeah. And, um, he wasn't playing, like I said, but he, uh, he came June of, of, uh, 2017 and it's been a ride ever since. Awesome, man. I think, yeah, my son was born 2017 cause he just turned three mm -hmm. in October. And when we were talking about it, we we're like, yeah, let's have another one. And so we're in talks because it's just my stepdaughter at the time. And I had just come to terms like, yeah, you know what? Like we can just have, we can just have Cindy. I'm fine with having Cindy. We can spoil her. Like I have no, I have no problem with that. She's my daughter. And we started talking about it and she's like, well, you know, when we first started dating, you were talking about having a big family and I just have a sister, but in like the Hispanic culture, there's big families. Like I have tons of aunts and uncles. I have tons of cousins and I just never growing up. My sister was a girl and she was four or five years older than me. And I never had an opportunity to just like share a house with anybody. I had spent a lot of times with two of my cousins. We were really close, but every weekend, one of us would spend the night at another's house. And I always wished I had a brother or another sibling and I'm Cindy goes to her biological dads on the weekend. And now that we have Asher, it, 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 we started planning for him. And after two months, we're like, oh, okay, let's just not, let's just not try anymore. Let's just be happy with Cindy. We have it. And then almost two weeks later, like, nope, pregnant. <laughs> like, okay. All right. Awesome. And so now that he's here, uh, we started planning again and we were wanting a girl and I'm like, you know what? You know, I'd be really happy with the girl. I think I like the aspect of Asher being my only son. And so we we're just putting those vibes out in the world. Like, Hey, we're going to have a girl. It's a girl. And then we open up the, 
the test after we go to the doctor. I couldn't go into the sonogram right now with COVID. Mm -hmm. So she writes it down. She takes a picture, writes it down. We end up coming back home and we open it and it's a boy. And so I'm still like, I'm smiling from like side to side. Like, ah, oh, I knew it was going to be a boy. So I'm happy with boys. We have a lot of uh, toys from my son. So we didn't get rid of a lot of those. We got rid of a lot of his baby clothes though. So it's like, ah, oh, that's a, that's a shot. But now that we're having another one, she's like, well, are you going to want any more? And I'm like, uh, we could probably, I, I'd be okay with a five. And then I'm in a couple of dad groups on uh, Facebook. And so they were asking, hey, how many kids do you guys have? Somebody posted six. I'm telling my wife, like, they have six kids. Man, I don't think we could do six kids. And she's like, you, you wouldn't want to have six kids? And I look back and I'm telling her, yeah, we could probably have six kids. <laughs> and she's like, why'd you say it like we couldn't? And I'm like, well, I thought you would react differently. It's I'm not the one that's having the kid. You know, we had we give them the ingredient and they're going through the nine okay. months to build it. So I always tell her like, it's, it's totally up to you. Like it's, it's not up to me. It's not my choice. It's so funny. You say that. Um, and also too, I don't look at, but my, my grandmother's Mexican. So um, I definitely get the big, the family dynamics too, especially with my other side of the family. Um, but yeah, my wife is one of three and I'm one of three. So it's very interesting to, we both were like, we could, we could do three, you know, yeah. then I think at this point now we're more like two, just because um, even though we're each one of three, our, our moms were for the lack of, for more, for, for more than um, half of it, a stay at home parent. Yeah. So that's a little bit different too. Um, yeah. That, that helps out a lot if you're able to be around more. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, I'd be okay with two. I, I'd love to have a girl. I, I don't know if that's in the works for me, but like you said, it'd be much cheaper if we had a boy because mm -hmm. we have the clothes, we have the toys, everything's yep. already like, you know, kind of the, the balls roll in that direction. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious though with you because so being somebody who had a, a step parent, you know, or <clears throat> that whole dynamic, um, how does, how does that inform you as a parent now? So I, growing up for me, I don't really think I had a ton of role models I really looked up to my dad. Me and my dad had a ton of conversations, a ton of, at the time, I thought really grown up conversations, probably. And I say that because they were never conversations I would have with another adult. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very formal when we're talking about topics. They were very elevated topics. It wasn't the normal topics I even talk about with my daughter now. He listened to a lot of talk radio. He watched a lot of news. So as an adult, like that's just stuff that you want to talk about what's in your realm. So mm -hmm. as a kid, like trying to get into stuff that an adult wants to talk about and learn, it was a little tricky. My, my role model, I always tried to envision was, was literally Batman, like mm -hmm. that dude. Cause he doesn't waver on anything. Yeah. And for the longest time, like that was my, like in my head, in my closet, like, I'm like, okay, like I want to have like the morals that Batman has. He cannot do no wrong. And it, it, it kind of crushes you when something does go wrong because you're obviously Batman's a fictional character. You can't be like Batman. And there's no one there to kind of bring you down to earth as a kid. Sure. And there's no one parents really try to <clears throat> shelter us as much as we can. We try to protect our kids. We don't want any mm -hmm. harm to come to them. It's just natural. And my dad was probably the biggest one that I looked up to. And I had no other that I can remember. I had nobody else that I can look up to that was a step parent. I had nothing else to look at. My dad is very, I'm not even sure how to explain it. He's, he's, driven by his morals to the point if something was immoral in his eyes he would give everything up to live under a bridge just to keep his morals mm. and has literally lived in his truck before for his morals uh, on on different issues for a few weeks at a time and so that that was my role model and coming in and and having a relationship, I always stuck, 
stuck to those kind of morals and beliefs. I'm very like moral driven. We, we, it's funny. Cause I believe like moral, we create what a moral is or ethics are like, mm-hmm. we create that. So it's just an idea. And I've always thought of myself as having really good morals and ethics. And that's really what drives me. So when I started dating my wife, she, she was my girlfriend at the time when we started dating and she had a kid, I never really even saw that dynamic that I was going to be a stepdad or stepfather. And of course I got, I got buddies that we always joke around with. We always had buddies and it's always a back and forth. And he was telling me, he's like, Oh, you're going to be, you're going to be a stepdad. I'm going to just call you stepdad. And this was like one, two weeks into dating Betty. (laughs) He's like, Oh man, like now you're going out with her. I'm just going to call you stepdad. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe I am. Maybe I'm going to be a stepdad, you know? And I never, I never thought of it as anything negative or out of the ordinary, but I looked at her as what she was like a a child. We see innocence in a child's eyes and Cindy's a very good hearted kid. So meeting her was just natural. It was, we, we bonded, not like a bond, like a fatherly daughter bond, but we did bond initially and there's probably things that we we do that we don't know what we're doing but it just feels like you're doing something right so mm-hmm. my my wife was sick when we were dating so i remember driving to her and giving her like a little animal and i would go and get cindy little things like that or when she'd come over i had um man what was it three i had a i had a four bedroom house and it was just me and I had my buddy living there with me. So my wife was staying over so much. Well, my girlfriend, my my wife now was staying over so much that I cleared out a spot in one of the bedrooms so Cindy can have a spot of her own mm-hmm. when she's there. Yeah. And it's just what feels right. Mm-hmm. And although she never wanted to stay in it, it would, it would be built up. She always wanted to stay near us and like on the couch. Yeah. I think it's small stuff like that, that it, it compounds over time and you have that relationship and it's a natural relationship. It's hard when, when you see step parents trying to force something or force love. And that's really difficult because they're not, they're not trying to force it in their eyes. They're just trying to do the right thing. And this is what they see on television. This is what people are telling them. So it's difficult for them. I think for me, hearing different perspectives from other step parents kind of re-solidifies like, hey, I'm doing maybe not the right thing, but I'm I'm in the right direction. Cause I really don't, I don't see myself as the best parent or the perfect parent. There's times where we're out and our kid's throwing a fit and he's not quieting down and we turn around and we see another parent and their kid's throwing a fit and they can immediately settle their kids down. And we, we beat ourselves up like, man, like, you know, I, am I doing something wrong in, in my household that my kid's not, you know, there's different things that we see throughout just our life, just going down to Target, going into a Walmart, the way everybody handles their kids versus the way you do or and it's simple things at least for me it is like hey come here and they're walking right next to you they're not touching everything and there's times where okay like that's that's good like I wish my kids would do that I wish my kids would behave what what am I doing wrong I met my job lets me allows me to like peek into people's lives for maybe about 10 10 minutes 10 hour and I remember meeting a customer who had three kids and he was ex-military I could tell he was ex-military and they come outside and they line up in a row and I started talking to him about his kids hey your kids are very well behaved and he tells me that they need structure I'm like hey I'm all for that kids need structure and he begins to tell me by the hour what he has set up for every kid and it it works and I was telling my wife about that. There's no way that I could do that. Mm-hmm. I don't have that kind of structure in my life to designate every single hour. I would love it for myself, but for a, a child, 
at least for me, I wouldn't be able to keep that kind of discipline for them. There's times where we say kids just be kids and we want them to just go outside, look at a butterfly. We, yeah, there's, there's just different things like that. So I think like, like you said, like different perspectives really do help. Well, it's cool you say that because I was thinking about this recently and um, I'm sure, I don't know if you're like me, but discipline is always big, like a problem for me, not necessarily like how I, re- well, how I react, but it's, it's kind of processing all the factors in my life that dictate who I am as a parent and making sure that I'm not doing this wrong. So I think about um, my mom, my mom was crazy for lack of a better word. I loved her, but when she got angry, that was when she was um, at her worst. Yeah. And her and everything, the way she disciplined me and my siblings was based on how it made her feel. And it was about her asserting control over the family. So naturally for me and my step my stepdad is much more relaxed. He's, you know, he's do what you're supposed to, but you know, mm-hmm. you don't ever and I, I was spanked as a kid by my mama. I, I had the belt, I had the the coat hanger, the spoon. I'm a lot of people from that generation have that. Um, mm-hmm. but my dad was like, You have no reason to hit a kid ever, you know, and um he always like had to kind of distance my mom when she would get that way with us and my siblings. Um and then I have a biological father who there's no discipline there because he wasn't really around. But right. so I have these interesting ideas. So for me as a parent, when my kid acts up by default i want to go to how can i control the situation how can i put him into submission and make him listen to me like how can i take away everything you know from him and like you know control him yeah my my wife is a teacher so she has all this wonderful you know child psychology background she's got all those tools that she's you got need, all the right? tools yeah and you know she like the other night he was he was being he wasn't listening and um he was getting up out of his chair to go walk around dinner time i was like dude no and he started like dropping food off the side of the table and then like (laughs) threw a fork and i wanted to like pick him up you know and not like throw him against the wall but you know like (laughs) shake it out of him because that's that's how i was raised yeah they're doing it like a cat you know they're looking at you and then (laughs) well and the the worst part is is that my son is me 2.0 like he is stubborn he's dramatic and he's defiant like everything that i am that I'm sure my stepdad is like, ha ha, serves you right. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's how he is. So I'm doing better at even de-escalating myself saying, okay, like I told my wife, I say, Julie, okay, I need to walk away because I'm, I, I, I'm not in control of myself right now. Mm-hmm. So I have to walk away and then remind myself like, okay, like don't do that. You know, and I'm getting better at not going from zero to 60, you know, I, yeah. I'm better at saying, Hey buddy, let's calm down. You know, I, and I say, okay if you can't listen to watch some consequences and i once i say consequences that's when he starts like listening but yeah it's this it's this combination of all these things then you see other parents whose kids are perceived well behaved or Mm -hmm. kids kids who are quiet or my kids very extroverted he's very loud he's very Mm -hmm. expressive so it's always this idea of you know of how can i take everything that i see around me that i'm feeling internally and how can i disassociate myself um i don't know if you know the armchair expert podcast it's no Dak, i don't think i don't think i've heard it's, it. it's Dak shepherd he's Kristen bell's husband oh okay okay <clears throat> and he had gwyneth paltrow on there and um she was talking about how she raises her children with her ex-husband and saying you know they have this weird family dynamic you know because he's an ex but he's still very they're all still very involved they still mm-hmm. love each other but it's this idea that you're trying to take this being who has their own hangups, their own issues, and you're trying to take as much of your own personal crap out of it and trying to make this, this person, somebody that can go out in the world and be kind and be empathetic and be good and be yeah. hardworking. But you, but you have to almost like disassociate yourself, every part of how you want to react, unless it's to help better the better them and get them ready for that part of their yeah, life. Yeah. Cause a lot of it, a lot of it is, uh, that saying caught then taught mm-hmm. a lot of it's caught then it is taught just like just like you're saying like when I get upset with him or he's not doing something the only way I instinctively know how to discipline is the way my mother did you mm-hmm. know and the way you're able to like recognize that now and even take a step back can, could you imagine what a game changer that would be if your mother had taken a second 
just to, you know what? I'm getting too upset right now. Let me walk away and then come back and talk to you. Cause that would have been, that would have been a game changer for me. Me and my uh, cousin who used to spend the night a lot, we joke around. He was so terrified of my father after uh, we were up all night and my father would sleep in uh, the front living room for us. And the wall was right against the couch with the wall was right against our, my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And it was hilarious because we're, we're making noise. So he would just bang on the wall for us to be quiet. And that, that would be our warning. So like, okay. Mm -hmm. And then of course we're, we're preteens. So we're making noise again. He bangs again. We get scared. Happens a third time. And then we, we knew we were being too loud again. We just didn't, we just didn't think about it. We're kids. Mm -hmm. And he comes in and he, he tells us to like, not in, he tells us in very colorful words, like, Hey, y'all need to be quiet. And, uh, like he doesn't close the door all the way. And so I go and I close the door and just throw it and it closes and he comes back in and he says, and don't be slamming effing doors. <laughs> and then he slams the door. <laughs> after he said that so we i was terrified because i already when he came back in after the door closed you know we're like oh let me close this door and as soon as it made that noise like as a kid you know like that was a slam he's coming back so as he came back in like i went under the covers i was so scared he said that and then he closed the door and i was like oh my gosh and then we look at each other and we start like just laughing, like not loud. We just start laughing because it's like we just cheated death right now. I remember one time my mom, my mom would always, you know, like backhand me because that's how she was. And I was like 14 or 15, right before, like a summer before she got sick. And um, she went to like backhand me and I did like uh, I blocked it. And I kind of backed it up. <laughs> And then I went to like a karate stance. I don't even know karate, but I went like into like a, like a defensive stance and I started like laughing hysterically because I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to see Jesus tonight. <laughs> yeah. He didn't do anything, but I was like one of those moments of like, what did I just do? Like, oh no, I am. What am I doing right now? Like, like where, like I see my body, you know, like <laughs> I'm floating in the air. It, it was amazing. Yeah. Those moments are, are the ones that uh, stick with you. I know uh, my dad he would be the one to discipline me. My mother would, would pinch me or she'd pinch oh. me if I do something wrong. We're in the, we're shopping down target or something. She would pinch me. My dad was the one that would, would either hit me with his belt or like spank me with his hand. But I do know that did also affect him. Mm -hmm. I did see times, not when he spanked me or before, but I could definitely see it afterwards that it did affect him when he hit me. So I, I could tell he didn't want to, and it's different for every kid. And it's hard to tell whether or not it's, it's going to be beneficial or not, especially when they're past that. When, when you can start using words to talk through problems, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more difficult to spank those kids. I, I don't, for me personally, I don't think so. I've even already said like my daughter's in middle school. She's past the age of, of being spanked in my eyes. Mm -hmm. There yeah. shouldn't be, I, I couldn't foresee a reason, even the worst ones that where I would spank her now. It just, it just doesn't fit with me, but in my dad's eyes, it was not. So I was getting spanked when I was in middle school. So as my daughter's age, 11, 12, 13, and I could see how, how it did affect him. And, and that's, that's rough because you don't, you, you see your parents and you see your father and you don't want to see them buckle under anything. So that, that still didn't stop me from being a terrible kid in mm -hmm. elementary and middle school. Yeah. But that's when I started to see like, okay, like I really don't want to give him a reason to hurt at, at my cost. If it's something like I can intentionally control if it's something with me, I used to just have a mouth on me when I was a kid and not, not a bad mouth. I would, I would just talk back a lot. And I recently spoke to, I still keep in contact with my theater arts teacher mm -hmm. from middle school and high school. I think of her as, as Mr. Feeney, you know, Mr. <clears throat> Feeney kept following yeah. the kids through the grades. Well, yeah. in middle school, I was in theater arts and when we went to high school, she became the high school theater arts teacher. And so we still keep in contact. And she remembers, she told me the other, the other day, she remembers I had this English teacher who absolutely did not like me. And I knew she didn't like me. And it was to the point to where she 
made up stuff about me. Mm. And I went to the principal's office because I got in trouble and I may have been a bad student, but like I talked too much or I talked back because I was always trying to defend myself. But having the thought of, hey, like Batman, if I got in trouble at school, ah, I told my dad that day, like on the ride back. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing I didn't do was lying. I, I never lied. And we're in the principal's office and she's saying that I was doing something. I don't remember what it was because it was totally false. And she made up a story about me. So my parents were there and my like they told me, get out of here. My dad told me years later, he's like, you know what? I know you don't think I have your back, but I told them, Hey, like if what we find out is true and this is wrong, like we're going to get some lawyers involved because like, that's not right. Mm -hmm. Which I was like, okay, that's good to hear years later. Not that, that year. Cause then I would have been walking around campus like, Hey, you can't touch me. <laughs> but my theater arts teacher was telling me, yeah, that lady is she was just a very unhappy person. She was very unhappy with her life. She tried to make kids' lives terrible from what she knows. And she's like, I just wish that I could talk to her now and just say, hey, go look at what he's doing now because he turned out to be a good person. You used to be so mean to him. And I remember that. I was like, yeah, that, that lady had something else wrong with her. If she had moments like you're saying where you can just step back and reflect and see what's mm -hmm. affecting you and you can kind of go back on it i think that's big especially for parents now because they don't have a lot of that like our parents never had a lot of that yeah i think there's so much more self-awareness um of our generation and i'm i'm assuming you're around the same age as me i mean you, you look about the same age as me. yeah i'm 30 yeah oh so, yeah so you're right there with me so yeah it's it's this awareness of, yes, I have these hangups and I have these things that I was treated in and being able to, to kind of say, okay, I, this is where I can work on myself. This is where I, there was that old world mentality of, you know, just tough it up, you know, you're fine kind of thing. But with mental health awareness now, what it is, it, it's great. Um, but yeah, I think about my, my experience as somebody who I've lived almost half my life without my mom mm -hmm. and I can, I have good memories of her. But if you ask me like rapid fire, what memories I have of her, they're usually about me being stressed or anxious about being disciplined or getting in trouble. And so the times that I consider when I go too far with my son or I get to that level where I'm at, at my breaking point, um, I, I feel bad about that. Like, like your dad would do yeah. with you. And I never want my son to have those memories of me of, of being terrible. I'm sure he'll have those memories because kids retain the weirdest stuff, but I yeah. this idea of if he can, you know, think back fast, you know, what memories he has of me, hopefully they're good and not like when dad flew off the handle, you know, or walked out of the room cause I was bad or whatever. So, yeah, no, uh, I think I talked to, I talked to Chris Corman the other day. I, he's one of my, my first interviews that I did, but yeah. I've talked to him offline too. And one of the things that he usually says is no matter what, like no matter what we do for our kids, that's changed from our growing up, they're, they're not going to understand and be able to appreciate it because they have nothing to compare it to in their lives. Mm -hmm. So it, it's good that we're doing it on our end, but I think we need to give ourselves a break too. If, if something does go wrong, like, Oh man, you know what? I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have spanked him for that. Or, you know, I shouldn't have raised my voice to him for this because we're not, we're not doing something over the top. Like we're not spanking them for, for speaking too loud. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not, we're not disciplining them quote unquote, like the way we were disciplined. In, in the same manners. So I think those are big. They may not appreciate it. They're like, yeah, well, you spanked me because I hit a kid at school. It's like, yes, that's correct. But also like I was spanked worse than that with like a coat hanger because I walked on the wrong side of the sidewalk or, you know, whatever it would be. Those are, those are things too. I think we can give ourselves a break because there's no way we can be perfect. And if there is a perfect parent out there, I want to meet them. I, I have, I have tons of questions. 
yeah that that's a, a really uh strong reality is that we are imperfect people trying to not necessarily raise perfection but we're trying to get as darn close as we can to yeah to giving our kid the best of everything we have of ourselves to give them um i, I guess the good the good side and all that is that really realizing we are going to mess up our kids on some level every kid is going Definitely. to be you know hopefully it's on smaller things you know like like my bedtime was 7 30 instead of eight you know or something like that yeah but i mean a lot of people joke about how you know they're putting away for college and for therapy at the same time you know what i mean it's <laughs> so uh but yeah it's it's acknowledging that i'm not going to be every the perfect parent for my son yeah um, and my wife is is a really good parent too and she i'm sure she'll admit that she has her own faults i don't see any because she's awesome in my mind but yeah. <laughs> um but it's this idea that yeah he's gonna have some issues yeah that i'll have to work through have to get past but i'm going to try to give him the most stable environment that i can in which he can be who he needs to be how he can grow how he needs to be how he can show his emotions like I, i'm not the kind of dad who ever has says like toughen up stop crying i've never been that yeah dad. I've, i was a sensitive kid so i never hide my my son I'm not like dude if you want to cry buddy i'm just gonna give you a hug yeah that's fine by me but you know it's when he gets a little more wild and i gotta rein him back in but i mean i'm just yeah. gonna give him the room to to grow and to hopefully help his personality develop um his daycare is always like he's a passionate child <laughs> and i'm like he really is because of things he cares about um and he he's getting better at vocalizing why he's upset or what's bothering him but yeah it's it's a That's lot to good. take in i don't envy him being i you know it's it's hard to be young and to uh not know how to articulate what you want to say or to even definitely not realize what you're what you're not doing you know instead of you know reacting oh because some kid has a toy i want i want to go take it away or like push him over or scream right it's not like hey can i borrow that toy it's you know stop and try to think about it so we're trying to get him to that point where he can um you know rationalize and kind of have the thought process of of reacting accordingly right well yeah. Corey, we're almost at 50 minutes here it's looking like 47 or so yeah but to kind of close this out if you had all the dads that were listening what would be your fatherly advice you would give to them um, I, I think if, the, if I could really realize what my experience was, um, being as a son and dad, I think it's just try. I think the reality is, is that you are going to mess up. There are days where it's not going to go the way you plan, but if you put in the work, if you show up for your kid, if you are involved in their lives, that's, that's worth its weight. Cause the kids are going to realize dad wasn't perfect, but dad was there and I could always depend on him. So definitely, yeah. definitely. Well, I appreciate you coming on and sharing everything, Corey. I hope you, I hope you really enjoyed it. I hope you, hope you Most liked it. Most definitely, it was great. Thanks for having me. Can I plug my podcast real quick? Do you mind? Oh yeah, me? definitely. Do a shout out. So bro. I, I just, um, I just launched a new podcast. It's called Emotional Duct Tape, and it's about how we process grief. So it's um, looking at not only how we process death or loss, but it's um, breakups, divorce. Uh, we talk about trauma on there a little bit, kind of, I told my story on the podcast last yeah. week, um, about sobriety, depression, uh, uh, physical illness. We, we cover a whole, uh, scope of things. And, uh, basically people come on talk about their grief journey and how they processed it and how they push forward. So it's kind of a mental health podcast, but we just launched that and, um, we're on, um, uh, uh instagram as emotional duct tape podcast um but if you search anywhere you get podcasts for emotional duct tape we're the first ones you see so awesome man and then uh send me that link i'll drop it i'll drop Perfect. it in the all for the sure. comments and captions and summary and stuff where, where i send this out this goes out and i think it's it's a few of the major podcasts like apple spotify i think if you tell alexa to play it you might have to tell her like four times but she plays it eventually <laughs> the okay dad podcast but yeah awesome man like i said Corey, i appreciate it man i really do think us sharing our stories with each other and talking about different things a lot of dads have in common so yeah i'm passionate about the dad stuff so thanks so much for having me it's been great getting to know you for the yeah. first time ever <laughs> so, same brother same yeah. all right all right well you take care you as well thanks all right you stay warm up there
<laughs> Bye. Lucas, what's up? Go tell, go call Cindy so she can record.